This is Climate One. I'm Greg Dalton. And this week, we're on the scene at the International Climate Summit known as COP27 in Sharm el-Sheikh, Egypt. The agenda includes loss and damage, accounting for the destruction forced upon developing countries caused by wealthy nations burning fossil fuels. I think this is the first baby step. What is being paid for? How will it be paid for? Who are the responsible actors or countries that have to pay for loss and damage in vulnerable developing countries? That is where the rubber hits the road. But most countries still aren't reducing emissions fast enough. You'd have to phase out all of the coal tomorrow if you wanted to build all of the gas that we're potentially oversupplying. And as global leaders negotiate, climate disruption continues. For me, loss and damage as a Kenyan means loss of heritage. It means loss of culture. This year's COP is being held on the African continent, and location matters. As Climate One senior producer Brad Marshland tells us, Egypt has a long, long history of recognizing the importance of a stable climate. I'm at the Temple of Kanum on Elephantine Island, a thousand miles upstream from where the River Nile flows into the Mediterranean. Here, the ancient Egyptians built what today we call a nilometer, a series of steps leading down to the water with inscriptions on the walls to measure the height of the flood. Kodom was a god. An ancient Egyptian believed that that god was responsible for protecting the source of the Nile. That's Makbola, a guide in Aswan. So he must be satisfied all the time, because if he's angry, it means that there is a problem with the source of the Nile. To someone who grew up in the California suburbs, where buildings constructed way back in the 1800s count as old, the timescales of Egyptian civilization are mind-boggling. 3,500 years ago, Egyptian archaeologists were discovering tombs and texts that were already a thousand years old to them. This incredible civilization owes its longevity to one primary resource, the Nile. It's sort of remarkable that, you know, this land, which is fed by waters that come from, you know, Lake Victoria and the Blue Nile on the Ethiopian mountains, um, is incredibly rich, to the point that this narrow strip that runs along the desert, you know, at the time, at the height of the sort of Middle Kingdom, was capable of feeding probably a third of the world's population. That's Giulio Boccoletti, author of Water, a Biography. He says that the flood predictions made here at the upstream edge of the ancient Egyptian empire, allowed the pharaoh's administrators to plan to store more grain in times of plenty in order to make it through the leaner years. The story, by the way, is is uh, told in the Bible in the guise of the famous uh, story of Joseph. And so the seven uh, fat cows that come out of the Nile and followed by the seven starving cows. And there are some archaeologists that believe that that story is the memory of that strategy to manage uh, the variability of the Nile. Occasionally would fail. Occasionally they wouldn't be able to store enough food to ride uh, periods of scarcity. Uh, but all in all, they lasted far longer than any of our uh, civilization. You know, they lasted uh, for 3,000 years. And that dependence on natural systems is just as important today. Water, water, water. That's Egyptian ambassador Weil Albumag, special representative of the COP27 president particularly because Egypt is a very, very arid country. We rely on one source for more than 95% of our home use, agriculture, industry, everything depends on the River Nile. So any disruptions caused by climate change in the area of water resource management is a problem for us. The Nile River Delta remains critical for agriculture in this country of over 100 million people. And Abumag says that climate-driven sea level rise compounds the threats. So the rise of the Mediterranean by even a fraction of a centimeter means salinization and acidification. And and you can just imagine the economic and social and and other impacts that this would have on the livelihoods of everyone living there, not to mention the food security aspects. So today, the dependence on a stable climate is just as critical as it was thousands of years ago. And at the International Climate Conference in Sharm el-Sheikh, the threats to water and food security to lives and livelihoods expressed by Egypt are being echoed by nearly every country in the world on ever more pressing timescales. Climate will not wait for us. There is no time to waste. And every 
measure delay is a measure that is going to be that much more difficult to implement and multiple times more expensive. But whether the leaders of the world gathered here at COP27 can deliver the necessary measures at the pace required to avoid the most catastrophic impacts remains to be seen. For Climate One, I'm Brad Marshland in Sharm el-Sheikh, Egypt. One focus of the conference is implementing national plans to cut heat-trapping emissions and keep global warming below 1.5 degrees. Those plans, known as nationally determined contributions, are being disrupted by Russia's illegal invasion of Ukraine, which caused a rush to expand methane gas production in other countries to replace Russian supplies. I met up with Claire Stockwell, senior climate policy analyst with Climate Analytics, the research firm behind the Climate Action Tracker report that evaluates national pledges. I asked what impact the methane boom will have on the 1.5 degree limit. Well, what we're really concerned about here is that it's going to put that limit in jeopardy of being able to to be reached. So we're sort of overreacting to the Russians' invasion and we're building oversupply. You know, I could give you a bunch of numbers, but if you want to sort of make it meaningful, (laughs) the International Energy Agency, so this is one of the main institutes that does um, energy policy and puts out scenarios, they updated their net zero um, scenario uh, a couple of weeks ago. And in that scenario, for the first time, they're showing a significant reduction in natural gas from last year and that's being driven by the drop in the cost of renewables and other options you know battery storage and other technologies coming online a lot faster so first we're seeing we're going to need less gas now in response to the russian invasion we seem to be oversupplying it and the extent that we may be oversupplying it it's equivalent we think about to if you look at the amount of coal that we anticipate is in that pathway you'd have to phase out all of the coal tomorrow if you wanted to build all of the gas that we're potentially oversupplying. So that just gives you a sense of the magnitude there of this oversupply. Right, and this is what suppliers do. Gas prices are high, so suppliers rush into the market wanting to get those high prices. And I think your report says that in 2030, the oversupply of LNG could be the equivalent of almost five times of the EU's 2021 Russian gas imports and double of Russia's exports. So this really is a glut in the making. It is. And if you if we I guess we don't know if all of this capacity will come online, but the problem is there's a risk and the risk there is twofold. One, it's either that it does come online and it puts the 1.5 degree target at risk or that we build all of this and it becomes a stranded asset. And then someone's going to end up paying for that stranded asset. And what in the in the European case, you know, we're here at an African COP. A lot of where they're looking to build and trying to expand to is in Africa. And that would be a stranded asset here that will be dragging down on their development, whereas instead they could have been focusing on either shifting to hydrogen or building out their renewable sectors and things like that. So that's why we're very concerned with Well, one thing I learned, uh, is, I think mentioned in your report by one of your colleagues, is that some of the advocates for new gas suppliers saying, well, we can just kind of rework it for hydrogen later. Is that viable? If, if there's too much gas, we'll retool the, the plant and and make them process hydrogen? That's a decision you need to make today because you need to know building in advance, I need certain types of steel, I need to build it in a certain way. So that's not something that, oh, that's a quick fix, I'll do gas for five years and then we'll switch to hydrogen or something. You need to make that investment decision today and that costs money. And all of this is happening at such a speed, we're concerned, are you really doing that planning and that thinking so that you can ensure that transition to green hydrogen in the future? Though this is being driven partly by market players, suppliers, uh, gas companies, Canada, U.S., elsewhere, but also by European politicians. And isn't it natural for any elected politician to want their voters to be comfortable to not freeze in the winter and and fry in the summer? So isn't the rush for reliable immediate energy supply logical and understandable by Europeans? The, the problem is there's a, there's a disjuncture between the timeline of when a lot of this capacity would come online. Uh, it's not so going to be for this winter. It's, it's not going to be for this winter. And so, you know, uh, I'm Canadian. There was a, a question on whether, you know, Canada could build out some of its supply in the east and ship that to Europe. That's going to take a few years. And when you look at the timelines, it's in those few, it's, it's sort of this year, next winter that Europe needs this uh, is in the energy crisis and when you could really get the LNG online is a much further timeline. So here we would want Europe to pursue other options. Heat pumps, they need to massively ramp up the amount of heat pumps that they're 
they're doing. There's a lot citizens can also do. I happen to live in Berlin. You know, I've turned down my thermometer for this winter and I will, yeah, continue it for this winter, next winter until we get through this crisis and save energy as much as you can. So yes, of course, I have a very privileged position. Uh, you know, I live very comfortably. We want people to be sort of safe and, and comfortable in their uh, environments. But at the same time, there are other options that don't involve this dash to, to gas. Energy is a notorious boom and bust uh, cyclical sector with like these wild swings in supply and prices. This seems like another cycle, but the difference there is that the climate's at risk. This is not just like another boom and bust cycle. Is that fair? Yeah, the, we're worried about that, the locking in gas, that if we, if we sort of overreact and we lock in the gas now, then someone's going to want to use that infrastructure and that would delay the transition to renewables and then put that 1.5 degree temperature um, at risk. In another response to Russia's invasion, European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen has called for stepping up renewable investments. How is that shaking out, especially in comparison to increasing gas capacity? Well, there, in the EU's uh, renewable energy plan that they put out, uh, they did increase their renewable energy targets, and that would allow them to overachieve the targets that they've committed to at the UN. So that's definitely a very positive aspect of the plan. Um, but we still think they need to move further there, and they can do more in, in the renewable energy space. And then they, that means also coming back to this context and the negotiations, they can strengthen their target further if they continue down um, accelerating renewable energy. So going back some years, uh, methane gas, sometimes called natural gas, branded as natural gas, was sold as a bridge fuel uh, to a renewable future. The IEA has declared the end of the golden age of gas. Yet uh, is methane still seen as a bridge, say, from coal to renewables in some parts of the world? Is that, is that bridge argument still holding sway some places? Well, it's not a bridge. I think that's the, that's the simple answer. And what you worry about there, we, we do need to just shift directly into renewables. The cost of renewables is coming down. But for a lot of places where I think people, where the argument may still hold sway, is it's this question of finance. And here in uh, at the negotiations, developing countries, they need a lot of support and a lot of finance to really unlock that acceleration to renewable energy. And so we do think that sort of unlocking and increasing the amount of finance in this process would help ensure that people don't falsely lock themselves into a fossil gas. Right. Future. And I heard one of your colleagues say that, you know, the markets will lend at lower rates to build a natural gas plant than, than a renewable plant, which seems like a real distortion in the market. Coal combustion reached an all-time high in 2021. We've been hearing about the end of coal and the phase down, phase out of coal was a big deal at Glasgow. And certainly in the United States, we've been hearing about the end of coal for a long time. It seemed to come back from the near death many times. There's a coal renaissance, and there's also countries pledged to exit coal. So how is that shaking out? Well, there, so there was a pledge last year in Glasgow. It didn't, though, cover when you look at who are the major coal, like who are the countries that really use coal fire power? Only three of those signed up to this coal there's exit about pledge. There's 10 that use most of it, right? The, there's 10 that use most of it. So first, in terms of those that have committed, at least in the context of the Glasgow pledge, would need to expand. But it's really a mixed bag when you look at who said they would and who wouldn't, because uh, South Korea is an example of a country that signed up to the pledge, but they really don't have a credible plan yet to exit coal. So they still need to work on developing that and making the promise that they made meaningful and um, and accelerating action towards that. Another country that did sign up to the pledge was Germany. They have brought forward their phase out date to 2030, but as we were talking about earlier with the Russian invasion, there has been a renaissance in Germany. They're turning on a couple of coal fire plants, but the government has said that they are committed to meeting that 2030 date. So as we said in the report, that, that coal renaissance really needs to be short-lived to address the absolute immediate energy crisis and then the phase-out accelerated towards 2030. Yeah, it seems to have nine lives or many lives. Coal, the, the death of coal has been, you know, prematurely announced many, many times. Some people would say that, you know, the climate, international climate calculus is really comes down to China. They are the largest emitter. So what's going on with China? These other countries are pretty small compared to China's current emissions. 
Well, China is a, a big emitter, but we need everyone to, if we're serious about meeting 1.5, everyone needs to cut emissions. But in, in China's case... So don't case, put it all on China. It's not just... China is okay. a very important player. We need China to act, but we need everyone to act, okay. basically. Um, and so there have been some positive developments this year. So they have advanced with some of the renewable energy plans that came out mm -hmm. in there. They do a, have a five-year planning cycle. Um, so in some of the latest plans that they've come up, they've, uh, they've uh, accelerated on renewables. But at the same time, they still have a very large... Uh, coal pipeline and we're not at one point last year it had looked like they were starting to sort of phase down coal now with the power shortage that they had um, at the tail end of last year they seem to have walked back a little bit from um, or, or taken their foot off the accelerator um, for phasing down coal so China still needs to implement a lot more policies and and focus on cutting emissions but there was some positive movement, at least in some areas, and that was reflected in the numbers when we looked at our, our policy scenario, that we did have a, an improvement in, in the Chinese numbers. So countries made some important pledges in Glasgow at the climate conference last year. You've said that countries gave themselves some homework. Did they do their homework? Who, who's getting an A and who's failing? Uh, they did not do their homework. Um, and they didn't do their homework on two fronts. They didn't do their homework on the targets. So they had said, they looked at the numbers in Glasgow and looked at where warming was heading with the current level of targets in action. And they said, well, we'll come back this year. We'll revisit and we'll strengthen those targets. And only a handful of countries did that. Um, and out of the ones that actually submitted newer targets, only a handful of those were stronger targets. So Thailand, Norway, UAE, Australia. Exactly. So Australia is the only G20 country that strengthened its targets. And then you had a handful of others that um, submitted as well. And so that has not really, well, that's positive, and that definitely we do see that in our numbers. That hasn't, and it, it will lead to lower warming at, overall. It's not enough to bring our temperature estimate down. So we still estimate that warming from these targets at the end of the century would be 2.4 degrees, and that's the same number we had last year. Ryan, I'd like to remind our listeners we're already at 1.2 degrees from pre-industrial times. You're saying if every country meets their targets, we're still in for 2.4 double what we have now and just think about all the floods and fires and everything else that we've been experiencing. And the other thing to remind there, that's the end of century warming estimate. It will continue to warm after that point. The only pathway that we have in our numbers is when, if you include all the net zero targets, so all the commitments of government have said that they're going to go to net zero, we then estimate that would lead to 1.8 degrees of warming at the end of century, and that will have peaked earlier at 1.9. Everything else, the numbers that we put out, show that warming continues into the next century. So that's right. not even the... the that's ceiling. not the end. That's not yeah. the end of it. I recently interviewed U.S. Special Envoy Jonathan Pershing, who was formerly John Kerry's deputy, who said that some countries like India are actually ahead of their stated targets. Some countries often do more than they're willing to commit to in an international arena. What do you think of that assessment that some under promise and over deliver? Uh, we do think India will uh, overachieve the targets that it put forward. So India was one of those countries that did submit an update this year, but and it, under our analysis, it will or it will overachieve in 2030. I guess the, the the thing that I would say there is, when we do the estimates of where emissions are in 2030, that's under the current level of action. So the new targets aren't really going to drive emission reductions further. So some countries do that they they don't want to gain the system a little well, bit they don't want to um to put forward a target that they're going to miss but i think this target india can easily meet under its current emissions so we think there's much more scope for india to go further and of course we need india to go further for one if we're serious about the 1.5 degree limit and put forward much stronger targets and there that's both what india would do on its own but also what india would do with international support because india does need to start reducing emissions but that's not something that it can, it can do by itself sure sure cuz yeah i mean they they've you know, very coal reliant and they're not a wealthy country we're sitting here you know, at this conference with people walking around who are, it's all about climate. We, we're talking about these numbers, 1.2, 2.4, and knowing we're like they're just like some number, and yet we know that there's huge amounts of human suffering attached to those numbers. So how do you cope with working with these numbers all the time? Well, 
We're at 1.2 degrees of warming. And, you know, anyone that turned on the news at some point this year, they saw the massive flooding in Pakistan. We have massive flooding in Nigeria now, major losses of life, record hurricanes in the United States, extensive destruction. Yeah, right. And that's at 1.2 degrees. So, yeah, you know, maybe the degrees and that's sort of technical detail, but it's, it's the, we're already seeing the impacts today. It is devastating, but I think it's also, it encourages you, you know, I don't want the level of impacts that we have now. So that's why I show up and keep coming back to these. I think I'd have to do the math, but it's, I've, you know, my first COP was 2003 in Milan. Uh, I didn't make it to all of them, but I've been here for a very long time. And you keep coming back because we have such a beautiful world. We want to protect it. And you just have to take that inspiration and keep coming back. It is possible. The cost of renewables is falling. The solutions are out there. We just need to keep putting one foot forward and, uh, and we'll get there. Claire Stockwell is Senior Climate Policy Analyst at Climate Analytics. Thanks for sharing your insights and what it feels like your sincere optimism and enthusiasm here. It's lifted me up here in, in Egypt. Thank you. You're welcome. Coming up, grappling with payments for the loss and damage caused by the global north burning fossil fuels. I would say to wealthy rich countries that uh, this is not going to open the floodgates uh, for, for future litigation. That's up next. Preeti Bhandari is a senior advisor in the Global Climate Program at the World Resources Institute and former chief of climate change and disaster risk management at the Asian Development Bank. I asked her to discuss loss and damage, which is on the COP agenda for the first time, and financing for poor nations. But first, I asked her what she thinks of the opening remarks by U.N. Secretary General Antonio Guterres. He called on wealthier countries and international financial institutions to provide monetary and technical assistance to help emerging economies speed their own renewable energy transition. Humanity has a choice, cooperate or perish. It is either a climate solidarity pact or a collective suicide pact. These are strong words, and I think he's portending uh, towards uh, if we do not cooperate and facilitate action that developing countries have to take to address climate change, we are doomed. And um, the window of opportunity, which we have been talking about for so many years to take climate action, um, has been closing and is almost closed. Currently, we are already in a world where temperature has increased Average temperature has increased by 1.2 degrees centigrade, and it is wreaking havoc in terms of climate impacts, in terms of events, extreme events that are taking place. I can talk about the recent event in the U.S., uh, Hurricane Ian, and the kind of uh, impacts it had in terms of uh, the number of people who lost their houses, the flooding that took place, and the infrastructure that was destroyed. So I understand that the damage is to the tune of $60 billion. And uh, this is happening in a country like uh, the U.S., which has the wherewithal to, to rebuild from these impacts. Uh, but think of a country like Pakistan, which has also recently suffered from uh, devastating floods with one third of the country impacted by it. And the tab for Pakistan is estimated to be around $30 billion. But Pakistan uh, is a vulnerable country that does not have the budgetary resources to respond to such a calamity. And uh, this is what the Secretary General is talking about, that it is in that context of solidarity that uh, there is an expectation in this multilateral process that the developed richer nations would come and act in, in concert in a cooperative, facilitative manner to help the vulnerable countries deal with these kind of impacts. So there's loss and damage within the United States. Florida gets hit. The federal government is there. But when there's loss and damage across national borders, the response is 
is very different. COP27 began with a surprise agreement to include loss and damage in the agenda for the first time since these meetings began nearly three decades ago. Egypt's Foreign Minister Sameh Shukri reportedly said the compromise breakthrough agreed the discussions would focus on cooperation and facilitation, not liability or compensation. But if it's not about money, what is it about? Is this more blah, blah, blah? Well, um, I hope, and it is sincerely my hope, that we are moving beyond the blah, 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 because in this multilateral process, having an agenda item is, is an important signal that some important decisions would be taken. And until now, loss and damage was relegated to a dialogue with no end in sight in terms of financing or any arrangements to help address loss and damage. So having it um, on the agenda for the COP, I think, is a big win for developing countries, represented by, uh, of course, the full block of countries, as it is known, the G77 uh, group of countries. And they have stood together in unison for the last one year to get this into the formal agenda of uh, of the negotiations. So it is a big win and must congratulate the Egyptian presidency for, for getting it, uh, you know, the due recognition that this particular issue needs on the agenda. But I think this is the first baby step. As you rightly said, how the negotiations develop uh, between developed and developing countries on what is being paid for, how will it be paid for, who are the responsible actors or countries that have to pay for loss and damage in vulnerable developing countries. That is where the rubber hits the road. And the next two weeks are going to be important on how some of these dimensions are, are built in uh, for an eventual decision making. And um, the COP president, uh, Minister Shokri, uh, very rightly also has given a timeline within which the negotiations on financing arrangements for loss and damage uh, should be completed. Uh, that is by 2024. So, so that gives a very definitive objective to work with, I, I would say, in terms of what would be the scope of financing, who will pay, who will bear the burden of it. And the two weeks of negotiations over here in Egypt are very, very important from that perspective also in, in getting at least the foundation of, of what the eventual decision would be on financing. Loss and damage is about wealthy nations paying for harm they've already inflicted on the global south by burning fossil fuels. But Canada's environment minister said earlier this year that he cannot, quote, in good conscience, put Canadian taxpayers at liability for risks that could be limitless. Others say that creating a loss and damage fund would not open wealthy countries to legal liability. How do you see the prospect of litigation impacting the possibility of wealthy countries paying for the loss and damage they have caused? The issue of liability and compensation, um, uh, you know, uh, related to paying for damages, which are which are coming forth because of historical emissions uh, by rich countries, definitely was part of the discussions over the years. In fact, it started way back in 1992 when, you know, the Framework Convention on Climate Change, which is the basis of all climate negotiations, was forged. And at that point in time, it was a small island country, Vanuatu, who raised this issue of liability and compensation and why there is a need for a funding mechanism such as insurance for vulnerable countries to deal with it. But even at that point in time, you know, there was no mention of liability and compensation in the convention. So that gives you a sense of, you know, um, how this this whole liability and compensation issue has been avoided since the time the convention was forged. But coming, you know, to more recent times when the Paris Agreement was uh, was forged way back in 2015, and Paris Agreement does include a specific clause on loss and damage due to climate change. But the decision in Paris was that 
loss and damage is not about liability and compensation. So there is a gentle person's, you know, promise over there, which was made in Paris, that this is not about liability and compensation. And to some extent, I think, Many of the developing countries have moved on also from this issue uh, or making it an issue of liability and compensation. And the fact that the president of the COP in his remarks again reiterated that uh, the consideration of financing for loss and damage is in no way related to liability and compensation is a reassurance, I would say, to wealthy rich countries that uh, this is not going to open the floodgates uh, uh, for, for future litigation. And going back again to what you quoted from the UN Secretary General, it is a question of solidarity. It's not about, you know, just the countries. It's about the poor people who are really facing the brunt of it. And let's not forget that this may also lead to, in this highly interconnected global world, uh, you know, it could lead to uh, some kind of boomeranging of impacts to developed countries also. If we, if I were to give you an example from, uh, say, a few years back when Thailand got, you know, severely flooded, then the, then, uh, the factories that were building the machine parts for Japanese car companies could not get those. The cars could not be produced. The cars could not come to the markets mm -hmm. in the U.S. Mm -hmm. And there was, uh, you know, that kind mm -hmm. of supply constraint. Yeah, in, so Intel those chips, kind, yeah, they yes. affected a lot of U.S. companies in a way that I think a lot of people absolutely, didn't absolutely. anticipate before then. So you seem to be saying that because there's language in the Paris Accord that this is loss and damage is not about a liability. If the U.S. or other wealthy countries contribute to a fund, they won't be sued. Denmark and Scotland have offered about $15 million in direct cash payments for loss and damage. What impact has that had, if any? I think it's an important signaling. It's not about the amount of money or, you know, how small that money is compared to the actual needs or the actual financing required, but the fact that they took this major step, again, in the context of solidarity and in the context of showing that solutions are possible if there is leadership to address this issue. So for me, as a token, this has been a very significant move uh, uh, by the First Minister of Scotland, Nicola Sturgeon, when last year, you know, she was uh, probably... Uh, the only one standing and making a case for this financing. And then um, this year, Denmark has also come forth. So so it, it is showing goodwill, but it is also showing the art of the possible. And I would say that um, it is also probably, you know, goading other countries uh, that a solution has to be found in the context of the multilateral process. There's a report by a group called the V20, a group of vulnerable countries, including the Philippines, Peru, Ethiopia, that says those countries have already suffered more than $500 billion in damages due to changes in temperature and rainfall driven by burning fossil fuels. Those countries would be 20 percent wealthier today if it were not for climate impacts. Have any leaders from wealthy countries acknowledged that they're damaging the economic growth of the vulnerable countries? Is that recognized? I have not seen an explicit recognition of it, but I do see some small groups in wealthy countries, you know, recognizing this as an issue. And I understand a small group, um, Danish Church Aid, uh, you know, which is actually working on the ground on the field, will be hosting an event uh, at this particular COP wherein they will recognize their historical emissions and how they need to pay for it. And Microsoft has announced their intentions to remove their historic missions for the entire history of the company, which is a corporate example of, you know, that historic recognition. Adaptation, think planting trees, raising seawalls, relocating communities after fires or floods. That's often not a money-making proposition. And I've heard many people say that we need to come up with 
creative ideas for financing climate adaptation. And adaptation is things that building resilience for the future, whereas loss and damage is about what's happened in the past. So what are some examples of creative ideas that could finance climate adaptation? Well, let me start with one idea that has been there for some time now. This is uh, levy on international air travel. If each one of us did our bit and paid, you know, even something small like $5 per, per air ticket that we purchase, you know, for our travel. And if that can, uh, you know, go into a fund for addressing adaptation, I think each one of us can then take that responsibility to help uh, the vulnerable people you know, deal with climate impacts. That's but, particularly relevant as we sit here among thousands of people who all flew to this Egyptian destination. Sure, yeah. sure, sure. And um, I... I really admire, you know, the young people who have got into this particular area. And um, I understand that V20 that you were talking about earlier, uh, V20 has set up a small window on loss and damage. And about three weeks back, they launched a crowdsourcing with the young people, the Fridays for the Future uh, group, which is young people, you know, um, advocating for uh, action on climate change. And they did crowdsourcing with them to give their lunch money uh, for loss and damage. Again, it is token. Wow. It's a token small amount. Yeah. But, you know, it it's shows powerful. where yeah. there is a will, a way would be found. So that may not give you the billions or trillions that one is looking for, but uh, it does show that... Uh, each one of us is a global citizen and has a responsibility to take. But apart from that, if you look at um, the private sector and the windfall profits that the oil and gas companies are making currently with the uh, with the current situation uh, between Russia and Ukraine. So there have been calls, uh, particularly by the UN Secretary General also, that maybe some kind of taxation on these windfall profits uh, of oil and gas companies and oil, oil and gas being, you know, a major culprit in terms of our consumption leading to em emissions. If those could be taxed, that is another source as well. The UK did that, by the way, but they did it only for domestic use, not to give to another country. Yeah. Yes. It comes back to, to how willing uh, the leaders are to coalesce around these options. The options are known, uh, but it is that willingness to draw on those options, I think, uh, that is the challenge at this point particular point in time. So the students might have small amounts of money, but they kind of have some real power there. International air travel seems to make sense because it's by inherently across national borders. There's a resonance there. Mitigation is a third category of climate finance that helps countries move from fossil fuels to cleaner energy. The richest countries committed to $100 billion per year in mitigation finance beginning in 2020. They fell about $17 billion short. They got to about 83 what progress are you seeing on that front? Well, we've recently seen an update of the delivery plan by developed countries on the 100 billion. Uh, they have reiterated that they will make good of, you know, uh, the shortfall on uh, the target of 100 billion by 2023. But what is of importance over here uh, is the 100 billion was supposed to be met in 2020. We are in 2022. So when we're talking about shortfalls, it is not only the 17 billion, you know, which was not met, but it is, if we look at 2020 to 2025, it is six years. And why I'm saying 2025 is because 2025 is when the new climate finance commitment will come into play. So these immediate years are important and the cumulative for the period 2020 to 2025 comes to 600 billion. So I think, uh, you know, painting it as just a shortfall of 17 billion uh, is actually okay. taking us per away. Year. Okay, so let's get that big cumulative number, not just a per year number, because the delay and the shortfall adds up mm -hmm, together, mm -hmm. of compounds. Right, okay. Well, the big picture here is to fund mitigation so we can stay below 1.5 degrees of heating since industrial times. How much money is it going to take to, to keep us below 1.5? There are various estimates available, but uh, 
uh, there's one which is you know widely accepted that it could cost between four to six trillion dollars by 2030 uh, to put us on the right right path. So there's gaps that exist. You know, how do we close those gaps? There is a lot riding on on the private sector because, as we know, government money or public money, as it is called, is is scarce. So much is riding on um, how financing in the private sector could be mobilized. It could be uh, through, you know, government policies and regulations, which encourage private sector to invest in the right thing. For instance, uh, the Inflation Reduction Act in the U.S., uh, the kind of incentives that are being given, if I were to just take the example of... Uh, Electric cars in the U.S. Or heat pumps. We love heat pumps on Climate <laughs> One, right? Yeah, people, you get money, and, and th that has had bipartisan support. It's, it's sort absolutely, of... Absolutely, absolutely. It's not government telling you what to do, but mm -hmm. if you do something, you get this tax benefit, mm -hmm. right? So... So, so that's a good example. And also, you know, um, uh, with the Inflation Reduction Act, uh, it is expected to spawn a lot of technological innovation in clean energy and renewables. And uh, there will be spillover effects then for the global economy also as technology improves and better technology is hopefully made available to the rest of the world also. In some sense, the money is there, and that's what, you know, recently the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has said, that the money is there, but it is not flowing into the right geographies. Right, right. Oh, I, I hear this a lot, that there's, a, there's not a lack of capital. There's a lot of capital. It's seeking good projects, good opportunities. There's enough money to solve this. It's just mm -hmm. not getting to the places. That, that is right. And that is where, you know, finding ways to provide guarantees for private capital to flow to riskier projects or riskier country context is important. And uh, that is where, you know, guarantees may, may be from multilateral development banks who are so involved in, um, in the development context of developing countries can use their limited capital to unleash the prospects of uh, private sector financing in the right directions. Well, when renewables are now cheaper than fossil fuels, at least for electricity, mm -hmm. in most parts of the world, why does investment in renewables still need de-risking in developing countries? Should that Shouldn't the market solve this? Well, um, in developing countries, it does need some amount of de-risking. The capital cost or, you know, the cost of the technology may have come down. But for developing countries to make that kind of an investment, they have to borrow. They have to borrow funding. There's only limited own funding that they have. When they go to international capital markets to, to borrow money, the cost of borrowing money is very high for them. And that leads to then a much higher cost than the actual technology cost. And so they're perceived to, they're, they pay higher interest rates because they're perceived to be higher risk because they're poorer countries that don't have as much absolutely, money. Absolutely, absolutely right. So how can, how can, you know, one help address that issue of cost of capital for developing countries, the interest rates? Um, and again, you know, it, it links to what kind of guarantees can be provided to help them um, deploy those technologies at scale. And uh, fin the finance world is an intricate world, as you know, and nothing comes free. So it is about, all about, you know, returns on investment. So how those returns of investment can be guaranteed is, is an important part of the story. You're listening to a Climate One conversation about the burning of fossil fuels in the global north and the loss and damage that inflicts on developing countries. Coming up, looking beyond money. Loss and damage steals away from us the hope that tomorrow is assured and it's going to be there, it's going to be better. That's up next. Let's get back to my conversation with Preeti Bhandari, Senior Advisor at the Global Climate Program and the Finance Center at the World Resources Institute. I asked her how finance can be embedded within the context of justice. 
the just climate justice and just transition um, that we are talking about at this point in time is an important part uh, from a moral and ethical point of view in terms of uh, what kind of climate action needs to be taken. But but the private sector will not follow that, that argumentation per se. Mm -hmm. So it is, again, you know... Um, what conditions are being created in countries? I can give you the example of South Africa, uh, where uh, a package has been developed called the Just Energy Transition Partnership, uh, recognizing that you know South Africa has to transition out of uh, coal-based electricity generation. But that means a country where you know, there are many who do not have access to electricity. So if you ask them to, you know, shut all their coal-based power plants, that is not justice, as you said. So for them to move into alternatives like renewable energy, I'll talk about the technology bit of it. We need financing for that. So to what extent can, again, you know, some of the government financing, both by South Africa, but also by developed countries like uh, UK and the US are part of this partnership. But how does that, again, give a comfort level to private sector to come and invest in renewable energy in South Africa becomes important. But the other part of it, the people part of it that I want to emphasize in these just transitions is when you shut down your coal power plants, when you shut down your coal mines, there are many people who would be left without jobs. So then there is funding required to reskill those people, create alternative sources of livelihoods for those workers. And that is important also. And uh, while you're shutting down one industry, you're establishing a new clean, hopefully clean industry. So do you, do you have the workers for that industry? How many of those people will be absorbed in the new industries? Would it be fair? Would it be fair in terms of does everybody get absorbed or, you know, do they have the right skill set to be absorbed or not? Mm, so yeah. so it's, it's a very layered question that you're talking about. You know, it's not only about finance flowing into the right things, but how that, you know, that scale of financing is mobilized. But more importantly, the people who are impacted, people who will not get the power when the old dirty industry is shut down, but also the people who are dependent employed in that industry how do we find alternatives for them so mm, complicated questions yeah, but we're is. just beginning to see you know some examples and a lot is riding also on this first uh, south africa example that uh, i just mentioned Thanks and for that. Uh, what lessons we will learn from there in a recent panel you moderated for the World Resources Institute on how to achieve a just and ambitious outcome at COP27, Carlos Lopez, the African Union High Representative for Partnership with Europe, said, it's not like Africans love gas. Africans are pragmatic. They need transformation. They need energy security. As we wrap up here, what do you think it will take to get the rich and powerful of the world to reduce carbon pollution and increase energy security? Interesting. You're talking about the rich and powerful over here <laughs> to reduce emissions. And uh, yes, uh, I think there are, again, you know, various imperatives for, for reducing pollution. The first is if we look at the local environmental impacts. Yes, the local environmental impacts of, uh, of fossil fuels are also um, well known in terms of the health conditions in terms of air pollution. So, you know, that is one imperative. Of course, the rich nations have the best available technology, so those impacts may have been managed uh, to some extent, but not fully. So, so, so that is one imperative. Uh, the second one, which is unraveling right now, the dependence on one country for um, oil and gas uh, here. So, so that whole insecurity issue uh, has come to the fore in Europe, but it, it has had ripple effects across across the globe as well. So, so European countries are definitely looking at, you know, alternatives. And for a short period, they may be relying more on gas, but they have remained committed 
uh, that they will meet their commitments on climate change. And there is a renewed and a much more energized look into renewable energy and cleaner forms of energy. So it's hitting hard the richer countries, at least the European countries, at this particular time. And they are, they are willing to go you know, the extra mile while recognizing in the transition they are, they are using gas. There's no denying that. But, uh, but it will probably unleash the third or the fourth, you know, revolution on, on clean energy. So for developed countries, you know, the renewable energy uh, technology costs have come down. All the various factors are right for them uh, to stay the course on, on the clean energy uh, pathway that they have committed themselves to. And um, that, is our, that is our hope, that the richer countries would then uh, really show the way and lead the way in... Uh, in uh, reducing carbon emissions because they have the wherewithal. They have the wherewithal to do it. And if they don't do it, then who else will? Preeti Bandari, Senior Advisor at Global Climate Program and the Finance Center at the World Resources Institute in Washington, D.C. Thank you so much, Preeti, for sharing your insights with us here among all these people at COP27. Thank you, Greg. Thanks for having me. Money is at the center of this conversation about the responsibility industrialized countries have for the loss and damage their fossil-fueled economies have inflicted on people in developing nations. Yet while money is important, it's not the only dimension. As I heard from David Munene, Programs Manager with Catholic Youth Network for Environmental Sustainability in Africa. Before we get to the quantifiable aspects of loss and damage, for me, Loss and damage as a Kenyan means loss of heritage, it means loss of culture, it means loss of spiritual values, for example, shrines and trees that we consider to be important to our cultures, our spirituality and our way of life. It is the loss of connectivity, connectedness with our land. It implies the loss of lives. It means uh, and productivity of the land to which we are connected from birth, we walk on it and to death we return to the same land. When it comes to the hope, the, the theft, uh, loss and damage steals away from us the hope that tomorrow is assured and it's going to be there, it's going to be better. It also means that I carry with me a lot of anger because I've seen things that I've grown around with disappear because of loss and damage, and I'm not even on the extremes of loss and damage as, um, as a member of, of my community. There are others who are adversely affected. It means I've lost my sanity, if, you say, if you'd like, to an extent, because now I have to deal with things I don't understand that I did not, because of the special needs and circumstances of where I come from, Africa, I did not really contribute to it. My forefathers didn't contribute as largely to it. And it's more than commas and brackets in texts at COP27. And as you come here to COP27 and encounter people, there's a lot of people here in dark suits from wealthy countries. Does that anger come up for you when you meet people on an individual level? Sometimes it's a, it's a mix of anger, uh, devastation, and pity. Because I, I pity that people would be comfortable on the 14th floor when the ground floor is caving in. I, I pity them because they don't seem to want to look down where their high horse is going to crumble into. Because if, for example, Africa collapses, we are the lungs together with the Amazon, the lungs of the world, and we are crumbling together because of this. When someone is comfortable because they can live and another is dying, I pity them sometimes. But I'm also angry that the conversations they, they hold um, seem to consider some of us as children of a lesser God. It's as if we are having a conversation about two different kinds of human families instead of one. If someone is losing their culture, their heritage, they are losing their connectedness with their ancestors. They are losing the hope for tomorrow. 
I would be deeply concerned. Yeah, we, many people in wealthy industrialized countries don't have those connections with place or ancestors. We've already lost that. And I'm feeling guilt as I'm hearing this. That's quite moving to hear you say this. You know, I mean, as an American, my carbon emissions have hurt you and your country. I know that it was not my intention, yeah. but I don't know if it's meaningful to say I'm sorry. Or like, I don't know what to do with that. I wish, I wish the, the opening of the inclusion of the agenda on loss and damage in this um, COP27 didn't come with that um, disturbing tagline of um, compensation is not admission of liability. Mm -hmm. Because if, if I killed your dog and decided to pay you without saying I'm sorry, or I contributed to the death of your dog and I didn't say I'm sorry, but I paid you, how would that feel to you? It would feel inadequate. So are you saying that money is important for loss and damage and yes. words and feelings and intention and apology are also desired and needed? I think they are more important, especially to the indigenous communities. Apology is uh, more important than money. I think because wow. when uh, when that money comes now, it will be backed up by good intention. Right now, um, it will be money because either A, we can afford it, or two, we want to just get forget about what we have done, bury this under the carpet. However, I understand that introducing the conversation about uh, qualifying loss and damage would even derail the small steps that we have already made to include issues of now finance. So I'm not saying that we should stop talking about finance for loss and damage. I'm just saying this should not be the end. It's just but a mere beginning. And you have seen it already before we even get into the talks. Some countries that were loss and damage of us before have started making pledges. Uh, so it means they already have the money. They can, I think there's an imagination that they can buy their way out of what they have done. Uh, and sure. that's, that's even more devastating. Sometimes uh, we encounter guys in the dark suits, as you say, out here, and they connect with our pain. But they are backed up by a political process to be here, and they have to toe the line. Mm, it's not because personally mm. that's what they want, mm -hmm. but collectively it's what they have to represent. Individuals are part of a bigger system. So colonialism has inflicted intergenerational trauma on Africa, on you, yeah. and... Yeah. Climate change is amplifying that. Will that pass on to your kids? Do you feel that? And will that pass on to your kids if you have kids? I think psychology demonstrates that, that there is no way you can evade uh, intergenerational trauma and historical violence. I like to make the reference to the work of Dr. Joy um, de Grey who talks of historical violence and intergenerational trauma after interacting with uh, the peoples of Southern Africa. Personally, when I came across her work, I, I began to understand why I can't, for example, watch uh, three movies about slavery or racism and not get angry at an entire race. I have to struggle with that. Sometimes I have to fall back to my Catholic faith to sort of reignite my hope in the entire human family. Forgiveness? Yes, because I... I feel the pain to date as I speak right now that my grandfather died partially deaf because I'm sorry. Okay, it's okay. Because he was he was slapped for refusing to carry a white man who was living with disability on his back. Yet the man had a wheelchair. I, I feel the pain of our grandmothers having to raise their children as single mothers because our grandfathers were in the forest. I feel the pain of the rape. I feel the pain of the abduction of little children. I wasn't there. I didn't need to be there. But I connect with the pain even of the African Americans. When I, when I watch some of the movies and I'm like, this really happened? It's, it's just devastating. And I'm sure... Whether I like it or not, I'm passing it on to our children. They don't know perhaps why this is happening. Maybe they are lucky. I will tell them about the historical violence and intergenerational trauma and how it's passed on involuntarily. But 
I don't know whether they will understand it. You can't control that. You know? I can't. No. Yeah. But it's a gift to share it with them. As we wrap up, what conversations are you having here that are meaningful to you at this conference, climate conference in Egypt? I'm having conversations with the friendly nations, I will say, friendly party delegations about uh, loss and damage. Countries like uh, Pakistan have really been on the forefront. But I'm also having conversations of empathy with the small island states and colleagues who come from the Samoa, for instance. But I'm also having bold conversations when I can. It's, it's pretty difficult to have these conversations with what you could say the perpetrators of loss and damage. It's not easy because every time you bring up that conversation, it's difficult for them more than it is difficult for you. It's something we don't, it's hard to look at. That we, yeah, 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 it takes, yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it, it's, yeah. Yeah, but I, again, I'm, I'm resorting to the interfaith liaison uh, group where we are able to congregate and, and sort of renew our hope in the human family that if the human family could do such damage to our common home, then it certainly has the capacity to undo that damage and reverse what we have done. Well, let's end on that hopeful note. If we can do it, we can undo it. Yeah. David, thank you for sharing your heart and your ideas with me today. Sure. Anytime. David Munani is Programs Manager with Catholic Youth Network for Environmental Sustainability in Africa. I talked with him at the COP27 Climate Summit in Egypt. We'll have another show next time as the conference wraps up. Climate One's empowering conversations connect all aspects of the climate emergency. Talking about climate can be hard, and it's critical to address the transitions we need to make in all parts of society. Please help us get people talking more about climate by giving us a rating or review if you're listening on Apple. You can do it right now on your device. You can also help by sending a link to this episode to a friend. By sharing with your friends, you can help them have their own deeper climate conversations. Brad Marshland is our senior producer. Our managing director is Jenny Park. Our producers and audio editors are Ariana Brocious and Austin Cologne. Megan Basilia is our production manager. Our team also includes consulting producer Sarah Catherine Coxon. Our theme music was composed by George Young and arranged by Matt Wilcox. Gloria Duffy is CEO of the Commonwealth Club of California, the nonprofit and nonpartisan forum where our program originates. I'm Greg Dalton.